This is Surfing Through Cinema. I'm your host, Hawaii Harry. Today, I will be discussing the history of cinema, which dates as early as the 1870s. Although many of the films were crude and incredibly short compared to now, this is the foundation on which all cinema stands on. This era is when all the major techniques and grammar of film were discovered and made popular. Without further ado, let's go into pre-1920s cinema. So, the way I broke this down is I'm going over the various decades that lead up to the 1920s. So we'll start off with the 1870s. And I won't go over each year of each de decade. I'll just go over the most important, in my opinion, that helped develop cinema as we know it today. So in 1874, French astronom astronomer Pierre Janssen used a device he made called the photographic revolver to photograph the Passage de Venus, which was the movement of Venus in front of the sun. This was significant because it is one of the first collections of moving pictures ever. In 2005, however, experts found that the surviving footage was just test footage he used to prepare for the real experiment. So the sad news about that is the real footage is lost forever. Regardless though, it still holds the oldest IMDb credit and this helped spark more interest in cinematography as a spectacle. Um, 1878. So Leland Stanford, he was a railroad business tycoon. He hired British photographer e e Edward Muybridge to answer the debate of whether a horse ever has all four of his feet off the ground when they are running. So Muybridge used 12 cameras to create sequential motion. These had strings attached. These cameras had strings attached to them so that the horses would set them off while running over it. Muybridge's photos had many instances of the horse's feet being off the ground, so thus answering the age-old question. Now, 1879, American George Eastman, he invents an emulsion-coated machine which enables the mass production of photography onto dry plates. Now, Eastman was the founder of Eastman Kodak, which we all know today as, Kodak, as the Kodak Company. His invention is widely used even to this day, and it's known as stock film, or 35mm film, for most cameras. So let's jump into the 1880s, which I label as the mass production of film. So in 1888, with Eastman's invention of celluloid film, this led to a mass production of it, making it ready available amongst consumers and artists alike. One of the oldest films still around today is called The Round Hay Garden Scene, which was a two-second film made by Louis Le Prince at his mother-in-law's house in England. Now, strangely enough, his mother-in-law died ten, years, ten days later, and it was very mysterious because she seemed fine and healthy when they were originally filming it. Also, on top of that, his son, Aldolfe, was found shot dead a couple years after he had testified against Thomas Edison. Now, Edison, he had become quite a tycoon, and he owned a lot of the patents for the different technologies, but we'll get into that later. And so, these mysterious things have led, up, led some to believe that Edison had his goons kill these people off. This is, of course, speculation, and I personally think it's just a freak coincidence, but it is a strange case nonetheless. Let's get into the 1890s, which I labeled Edison's Empire. Now, Thomas Edison began to patent many inventions, like I stated earlier, and they were just direct copycats of other inventions made by people around the world in Europe and Asia. And he made his own versions and claimed to be the sole creator of it all. Okay, and this gave them lots of power over the creation and distribution of film. And in 1893, he created the first film studio that his co-workers called the Black Maria. With all this set in motion, he would later organize 
the Motion Picture Patents Company, and with this he was able to gain control over cameras, projectors, celluloid, and many other devices of film, making it impossible for small companies to thrive and make their own. And it also caused a lot of controversy amongst the original and true creators of each of these devices. So, now we'll get into the second topic, which I label Hollywood's Beginnings. In the 1900s, Thomas Edison gained total control over the industry, which led many to call this a monopoly. Now, eventually the Supreme Court agreed with this, <clears throat> that Edison, in fact, was making a monopoly. So in 1915, he and his company were accused of making a monopoly. Um, they didn't fully make that into effect until 1918. The damage had been done for over 10 years, however, which led many filmmakers, many independent filmmakers, who moved west um, to get away from Thomas Edison and his goons. They settled for California, which is the furthest away from Edison, who is in New York, and they started what we know today as Hollywood. This area became the world's leading filmmaking capital, and it still is to this day. With this freedom, studios were starting to become popular and would be the dominant system of how films were made. Since so many people moved to Hollywood from New York, especially during the 1910s, this caused a boom and in interest in entertainment made with film. So Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, just to name a few, are names of popular actors that arose from this time. What makes these films different from earlier ones is they had characters to relate with, linear storylines, and had clear beginnings and endings. So, each of these subsequent decades led to what we know today as the silent era. We had silent comedy, silent horror, silent westerns, but basically all the genres of film that we know today started up as a result of all of these different decades. Now, a lot of these films sadly have been lost due to many variables. In those days, film was made with this um, coating that would eventually um, combust and flame and burden down many buildings. And so as a result, many have been lost due to this, or they dry out, or they don't, for many reasons, they just don't last. Another interesting aspect is because none of the original copyright holders are still alive, much of these films are in public domain. So it's easily accessible to see whatever we have left. And it's a lot easier now with YouTube and other various <clears throat> other various things. As in the olden days, you saw it once and then you kind of forgot about it. So today we're really lucky to have technology that allows us to watch these things we may not have without um, without them. Well, we're going to go on a short break, and we'll continue discussing about pre-1920s cinema. Surfing Through Cinema is a podcast that premieres weekly on Monday mornings at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. For more information, visit our website at www.anchor.fm forward slash surfing through cinema. Okay, we're back. During the second half of the show today, I like to discuss about the key directors of this early age of cinema. So, to start off with uh, Georges Méliès, he was a French performer turned filmmaker. He is known for his short film called A Trip to the Moon, which was released in 1902. Now, a little uh, explanation of the film this was about a group of people who landed on the moon and encountered some aliens. And the chaos and the different crazy things that happen as a result. So he helped create some techniques with this film that we use today, such as double exposure. And this is for making two people, for making one person appear as two different people. And you could do this just by using any old camera. He also helped create special effects that he learned from his days as a magician, and this helped create many fascinating illusions 
such as when he removed his head in the film The Four Troublesome Heads. Sadly, despite all of these amazing technical aspects and technical things he discovered, he died a very poor man. It wasn't really discovered again until he was already very advanced in age, and he died shortly thereafter. So, many reasons why he wasn't as popular and close to the end of his life was due to the fact that World War I had totally destroyed the majority of France, and... <clears throat> for many poor financial choices from his brother, since they were in a company together. Regardless, his effect on cinema with his special effects and camera techniques and tricks are still used. In recent years, he was shown as a character in the 2011 film Hugo, directed by Martin Scorsese. The second director I'd like to talk about is D.W. Griffith. Griffith. He was a very controversial man even at the time he was alive. Many consider his career a double-edged sword. On one hand, he created interest in feature-length film with his magnum opus, The Birth of a Nation, but on the other, the same film had a very twisted view of slavery and is found to be very inaccurate of how life was back during the Civil War. He helped to develop the close-up this was done by having the background blacked out entirely, except over the item he wanted our eyes to focus on. So, in the film, uh, Birth of a Nation, there's a scene where John Wilkes Booth, he's uh, about to assassinate Abraham Lincoln, well, he pulls out a gun out of his holster, and then the camera cuts to a close-up of just the gun, so we know what he's about to do, which is murder President Lincoln. Like I said earlier, critics at this time are angered with his depiction of the Civil War. So in response, quote-unquote, he created his film Intolerance. Now this too is a masterpiece and a masterwork. Um, this film takes place over several time periods, including that of a contemporary piece about crime and redemption, about the life of Christ, and the events of the <clears throat> of St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and about the history of Babylon. So what this film is mainly known for is there's a early example of a tracking shot when the camera is moving down showing the different parts of the kingdom of Babylon. This film is still considered a classic today but it didn't have as much of an impact as did The Birth of a Nation. Um, another thing he is known for is founding United Artists, along with Charlie Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks. And this was a studio where actors wouldn't have to rely on the studio for making movies, but rather on themselves and taking charge in what they would and wouldn't do when it came to film. So, my views on both of these guys. So, what I really like about uh, Georges Méliès, <clears throat> he's considered the father of special effects, and I highly agree with that. I think more people should focus on him and learn about him since he has such an impact on the industry as a whole. You know, before him, a lot of films were just spectacles and examples of the, of the use of the camera. But he brought in you know, his theatrical, his magician, he was a showman. So he wanted audiences to be entertained along with marveling at the spectacle of it. Another thing I found really cool about it is in the film A Trip to the Moon, in some versions, you could see that they hand-painted over each of the cells so they'd be in color. Yeah, And it wasn't that they couldn't make color or color film didn't exist. It's just that the process was very, very expensive. And because each of them, because each scene was hand-painted, that meant every single version of it had to be hand-painted, which wasn't time, timely at all, wasn't efficient. Which is why you don't see many color films during this time. So I really like the guy, and I'm really sad that he's not known as much as he should. Now, D.W. Griffith, um... I agree. I think he's very controversial. 
And I also agree, it's kind of hard to totally disregard him because without him, we wouldn't have feature-length films as we know them today. I really like his style. I really like the the sets he would make, the different angles he would do. It's very good, very talented at it, but it's very hard to ignore the fact he was very controversial. So this is kind of a shorter episode today. I just wanted to briefly discuss the history of cinema before the 1920s. And from here on out, whenever I do the uh, what I call the studio week, I'll be discussing a specific decade with a specific studio in mind. And the reason why I didn't do that this time is because, because it was the beginning of film. There weren't really any studios yet. Next time, I'm going to focus on one of the best action films there is and its impact on cinema as a whole. And there have been many copycats of it. There have been many um, other versions of it, if you will. And so, until next time, this has been Surfing Through Cinema, and I've been your host, Hawaii Harry. Take care. Thank you for listening to Surfing Through Cinema. Make sure to check us out on Facebook at Surfing Through Cinema with Hawaii Harry and on Instagram with Surfing Through Cinema. We also have a website, www.anchor.fm forward slash Surfing Through Cinema, where you can learn more details on upcoming episodes and on past episodes.